welcome back. This is Laurie of Laurie Sewing and today we're going to just kind of jump into a whole new project. Yesterday I finished editing the, let me see if I can get this right, <laughs> Little Pieced Prairie Point Placemats video. I've received a couple of things. I went and picked up the acrylic sewing machine table that I ordered when I my husband bought the Brother uh, NS80E sewing machine to kind of fill the gap for when George, my Bernina, was in the shop. And this uh, Brother sewing machine has filled that gap very nicely. The recent addition of the acrylic Sew Steady table I haven't used it yet, but I'm kind of excited about it. All right, we're going to see if that doesn't help with the exposure issue I suddenly had. I mean, they say that, you know, open windows, bright light from the outside is the best, and I all of a sudden went from having decent lighting to I feel like I'm in a cave now. I haven't used it yet. I'm hoping that I'll get a chance to do that today with the new project. But I wanted to talk about it just a little bit since I do have it in my possession. First, I want to let you know I did get the can of basting spray. Uh, I have stopped using 505 because it's just the same thing to me. I don't notice a big difference. And 505 in the past has actually stained the fabric that I've been trying to bind batting to or whatever. Um, I haven't had that problem with the little um, basting spray that I purchased. And the other thing was this Heat and Bond fusible interfacing. It is heavyweight. And then the other thing that I ordered and received was a very tiny bag of Mountain Mist um, batting. And <laughs> when I purchased this, I mean, I knew that it was 36 by 45 inches, but this bag is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 inches from here to here. Let me get it where you can see. That's 11 inches. I mean, it's the weirdest looking thing I've ever seen. And when I got it, I thought, that can't be that batting I ordered. Evidently, it is. So, out of idle curiosity, I'm going to go ahead and open it up, and we're going to see. Let me move you back a little bit. We're, we're just going to see how ridiculous. It has to be folded over on itself. I mean, it just has to be. Yeah, it is. I can tell. So, this is like that yeah it's folded it's folded like three or four times actually so it will if you order it it will be a shock it literally probably weighs less than a crow feather and it will be a tiny little roll but it is exactly what they say it is 36 by 45 so as far as the acrylic so Steady is the brand. As far as this table goes, it comes with this. And the reason that it's open and out and I didn't do an open with you is because it arrived over the weekend and my husband helped me turn my mat around, the big huge mat that covers this entire table. And I think I mentioned in a video that I, I needed to get this, let me point where you can see what I'm pointing at, this way back corner, way, way back in the back corner, used to be up front right here on this edge right here. And it was so torn up from being used that it didn't have, uh, just a few of the dark lines were left it, was, it looked like Wolverine had been using it as a scratching post. I mean, it was just a nightmare. So 
I've decided that I was going to flip it around. And we did that on Saturday. And lo and behold, this arrived. So we just set everything up. It was easier with his help. So anyway. But it comes in a box and it's about that thick. And then um, it has a little accessory pack. And these posts right here are not attached. There's just this little like um, button that you attach these to and that needs to come down just a wee bit. I think it's too high. And they're adjustable so as you can see I'm just turning this little dial and each of the feet has its own adjustment so you can either move it up so that it's flush with your sewing machine arm or down or however you need to do it and each one uh, will move independently so you can adjust this one and that one back there and that one over there and the one in the middle has a suction cup that it um, sticks the suction cup is separate when you purchase it it comes in a little bag of these posts and you just stick it to the center of this part of the table um, you could even put it out here a little bit um, but it it helps to steady the big expanse from this edge right here to all the way over here that's how that works it just slides on you cannot have your accessory box on your sewing machine though I had to take mine off and all of the instructions are in this little you know how to do it and if you've got a uh, cabinet you know where your sewing machine actually fits down inside of a cabinet they also make that type as well and it tells you how to install that on the other side it also tells you in here that you can only clean it with a cotton cloth so it will get dusty and I'm planning to just use this it's a kitchen towel um, I'm planning to just use this as a like a cover up to kind of keep it from getting dusty. We'll see if that works. I don't know what it's like where you live, but here in the Pacific Northwest, Snohomish County, Washington State, it is so cold. It's June the 8th and I cannot believe. I mean, I was actually worried about my plants last night. It's just ridiculous. I hope I really, really hope we're going to get a summer. Um, I might have to drive either south or east or both just for some heat this year. I have not felt like I've had to do that in the past, but it's getting to the point where I'm starting to feel like I'm going to have to. Okay, I'm going to pull the sewing machine, and I'm having to lift the Sew Steady table because this leg with the suction cup wants to bend... So I'm just picking it up and sliding it closer to me. Oops. And I will reattach. I don't think it's close enough yet. There we go. And I may uh, use George and Brother Louie in tandem on this project. I haven't decided fully yet how I plan to do that. I can see that this leg is not on the mat. It's there, I think now. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, now this one is too high. I think the whole thing is, is that once you get this set, you don't really want to move it. And I know that my mat, the big one that I was talking about earlier, not this one, but the bigger one, has got um, some issues um, as far as smoothness goes. Like there's waves. There we go. Okay, I feel like I'm getting a little bit better contact with the table now. Yeah. 
The main thing I'm looking for is to make sure that this is flush. Okay, perfect. All right, so today is the day that we're going to start on this pattern, the Vogue 9699. And just a real brief, quick little refresher here. Way back when I first got the pattern, I showed you how I organize when I have a pattern that has just a multitude of small, little, papery, easy to lose pieces like this one. So I put them into envelopes after I cut them out and I label what they are. So this one is the girl clothes for this pattern. This one is the boy clothes for this pattern. This one is the cardboard guides. Now we have cardboard guides for hair for both the boy and the girl for this pattern. And this is a series of teeny, teeny, tiny, almost microscopic sized patterns, most of which will either be uh, traced onto the fabric and then cut out, or um, they'll never be cut out. And I'm just gonna trace them onto paper so that I'll have a, um, a reference pattern piece for future use. So some of them are quite tiny, like the eyes. That's number 11, 12, and 13. I didn't even remove that from the actual part. Like, I'm not going to cut this out, or this, or this. I'm just going to trace. They don't tell you that on the pattern, but clearly if you tried to use these pattern pieces, they'd be gone. They just dissolve into thin air. So that's that. And then the body of the, of the doll, both dolls for that matter, is all, has been cut out. They're all over here. This is the felt for the eyes, and I'm just keeping it in here. I do have one set of eyes cut out. I, my plan is to make the girl first, and we will go ahead and get all of the little frustrating how-tos worked out, and then I'm going to enlarge lengthwise the boy doll I want him to be taller than she is because I plan to use him as a mannequin. Okay, so I don't need this envelope at the moment. As far as I know, everything I need is right here. We will soon find out. And excuse the weird noise that uh, Brother Louie makes when, the, when I hit the power switch. It's the weirdest thing. Here you go. I don't know. All right. I need the instructions. There are three pages, I think. Yeah. Three actual physical pages. And for a total of six information pages. I'm going to need those at the beginning. I'm going to obviously start off with one or two. Page two. Okay. So the very first step is that you're supposed to do the eye sections. And I will, but I'm not doing it first. I've already cut out the felt for the eyes. I have a white, a bright blue, and a black. So the white is the biggest. The blue is the, is the middle sized and the black is the little tiny, tiny piece, just like they suggest right here. Okay, I'm gonna start with step two. And I mean, they're saying that I need to interface that with my interfacing, which I will, but not right at the moment. Okay, so I need to stitch the darts in the front and then press the darts open. Okay, so we'll start off doing that. Now my suggestion is go ahead and either get a pin dish, 
a pin cushion for your wrist or just a pin cushion because you will be putting pins in and taking pins out of all of, all of these pieces. Okay, and I need the front piece right here. And as you can see, these darts have been cut. They're not drawn, they're cut into your pattern piece. So we won't need to open them up. They're already going to have an opening when we need to press that open. I believe I've already marked everything. Yes, I have. So I can go ahead Now I know the front is the front because it is the bigger of the two main body pieces. It's larger than the back. I'll show you what I mean. So here is the front. And I'll hold the back up so that the lower edges are matched. So there's the back and as you can see it's smaller so I don't feel like I need to mark this with an F for front okay all right so we just match up these dots these little dots like so and everything is stitched with a quarter inch seam allowance. Okay. I wish I could remember. Oh, I don't know. I'll just have to see. I'm Quarter inch is way back there. The width of my foot, apparently. Oh, it's marked on the front as well, so you can line up your fabric just like that. Okay. I'm just going to do a straight stitch and yeah. I'm just watching right there. It's locking the stitch because I pushed that button. What I'm trying to figure out, I'm going to have to get my little information booklet out again, is how to have it. Oh, it's automatically stopping in the needle down position. Okay, I don't have to worry about that. I'll give a quick explanation of this. I use thread to fill things and when I say thread I usually mean thread from my sewing machine. I do have just wads and wads and wads of thread. But I've been also saving pieces this size of fabric instead of putting this with my cabbage um, because most of the things that I use to fill are small and that would that would work really well and um, when I say fill I mean like a pin cushion or a I don't know a doll body fabric is heavier thread is heavier than polyfill so if you want to add weight 
into a stuffed doll, pillow, pin cushion, fill in the blank. Um, the saving your thread and your little tiny pieces of fabric instead of just throwing them in the garbage is a perfect, perfect thing to fill those items with. So that's why. And, and also, here's another thing. If you want to make sachets with, you know, uh, essential oils like lavender and lemon and eucalyptus, they also will hold that scent really well um, also. So you can just, you know, kind of mix in your essential oils with this. Just blend it in, put it in, in like a, um, a bag and let it sit and then make your sachets and fill them. Be perfect. If you want your sachets to be smooth and not crumply looking on the outside, just take a little tiny bit of um, batting or fusible, thick, heavy fusible interfacing to the fabric and then fill and that will keep some of the lumpy bumpy stuff away. I suppose I could make one one time to show you what I'm talking about. But sachets are so wonderful. They just make your house smell delicious and it's a great way to use up some of your cabbage because they're not very big. All right, back to work. So here's the first one stitched. And I haven't pressed it open yet, but if I finger press this, you'll see what I mean. We're just going to open that up like so and press. And mine looks identical to the instruction sheet. It's got that little bump of fabric right there. But when we flip this around, that little bump is what gives your front piece some shape. So, all right, so same thing. We're doing this right sides together, matching up those little tiny dots and stitching one quarter of an inch from the raw edge. So, there's that. If I'm not mistaken, we do the same thing. No, 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 no. We don't. We do an ease stitch on the lower edge between the dots. So an ease stitch is a bigger stitch, about four, four and a half. And we go between the dots and we're staying on that quarter of an inch. Just realized we don't need that. Now the whole point of an ease stitch is that you have the opportunity to pull the stitches so that it will help fit the body to the legs or the body to the back of the body. So we don't want tight stitches and we certainly don't want them locked. So there's that. Okay. And next we will work on the sleeve of the arms. So in the instructions, after we have turned in the seam allowance on the lower edge of the front and pressed, we will then be stitching the darts in two of the arm sections and pressing the dart to one side. So let's go ahead. And these darts look like this, and I have not marked those. So I'm going to grab my friction ink pen. Remember, of course, that friction ink is heat erasable. It is um, not meant for fabric, but people use it for fabric. Uh, and if you erase something uh, with your iron, you'll have to reapply if you need it. Like for just an example, I, um, I pressed 
the the dart open on this side and erased the circle that was on this side over here because I hit it with the iron by mistake and then uh, there's another dot along the side right here and I erased this one because I hit it with the iron so if I need those all I have to do is take my pattern lay it on top and redraw them on they might be in a slightly different place because of the darts so you just kind of have to manipulate your pattern to get it as close to, you know, back to the spot where it was before, like right here, would be right on that corner. And I just kind of use these marks as landmarks. I'm not, I don't have, they don't have to be perfect, in other words. All right, but I do need to know where all the marks for this particular piece are. figured out what I've done wrong here. You only have to mark two of the arms. You don't mark all four of the arms. So I'm going to mark or keep these two this way. And I'm going to go erase this and this will all make sense in just a moment. So it says stitch dart in two arm two sections. My, my mind automatically thought they were spelling out the word two. <laughs> they really meant two. So that's what the situation is here. So now we're just going to make the dart by folding it like this and stitching it along that line right there. Okay, I went ahead and stitched these darts on the Bernina because they, I just needed a little bit more control with the reverse settings and I, there could be a way to back up one stitch on this machine, but I don't know how to do it yet. So anyway, just cut these apart, remove the excess thread, and then we're just supposed to press the dart to one side. We don't have to cut it open. And that will kind of give us that sweet little hand wrist situation thing. And the same thing on this one. As far as these little hands go, they're half circles, kind of. They're like mittens, which isn't, you know, it's not quite as, uh, ouch, difficult as sewing in a circle, but you do need to be consistent with your seam allowance. So if you're concerned that you won't be able to hold that seam allowance, a little bit of practice is a good idea. And also, if you need to mark your seam allowance on your project you can also do that with your you know, with your friction pen there we go and I don't ever ever sew over pins
Okay, and I'm going to turn it over and start on the where I was over here. I'm going to just, I was sawing along like this. Now I'm going to flip this over and start back over here and go all the way around and stop here. Maybe where you can see what I'm doing. Okay, whoa. Get it to focus, all right. Oop. Let me hold something so it will focus. There, okay. So this is the little dart right here and I'm just gonna hold it down so that it will match with the rest of the fabric on the on this side over here. Okay, so I do need to make sure that that fold has been pulled out. Okay, well, let me do that again. Get this to focus. Come on, camera, there we go. Okay. We, we turn this out first, then we stitch, leaving the end with a single clip. Okay, so when you, when you have something that looks like this or is a circle or has um, little spots like this, little corners like Valentine shapes, you need to take your scissors and clip right up to your stitching. I'll mark where it is so you can see it with, I'll use this friction ink. Okay, is that showing up a little bit? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna take my scissors and clip right there, just to the stitching. And again, I'm gonna clip right to my stitching. So I have got my second row of stitches around the outer edges of the hand and now I'm going to turn this arm to the right side as the instructions have said. Now that can be a little difficult to do so if you have access to a hemostat Sometimes, and I will probably use my jewelry, needle nose, doohickeys, they make this kind of work easier to do. So I'm going to do this, and I recommend having a chopstick or a point turner, something long and thin. I wouldn't recommend using a pencil, even on the eraser end. They can, they're pretty rough on fabric. Okay, pull this out like so. And then if you need to, you can take your hemostat, whatever you might have, carefully. My hands get tired and that's why I typically end up using something like this. Okay, now I'm going to take my, not the pointy end, but the non-pointy end, and kind of push it in there gently. You could easily go through the stitches, and then you'd have to start all over again. There's the thumb right there. Just kind of push it. Round out that wrist. And there's your first little hand. All right, I'm using just your plain basic uh, Polyfill Crafters Choice Dry Polyester Packing. 
Uh, it's the first bag of dry polyester packing I've ever used, and I love the way it feels. So I, I bought it. I'm not affiliated, non-sponsored. Just something I purchased, and kind of by accident, I got the dry. I don't, I don't know why that makes a difference, but it does. All right, so the next instruction is after we get the arm stitched and turned, we are supposed to stuff the arm loosely with a small amount of fiber fill. Then we are supposed to uh, stitch the arm along the stitching lines through all thicknesses and then continue to stuff the arm firmly to within 5 eighths of an inch of this opening here. Then we're going to use small handfuls of the fiber fill and the blunt end of a wooden spoon or a dowel because we have to get that fiber fill in between where we've made those stitches for the fingers. So I would say this is probably enough that we could say we have kind of stuffed it loosely. I'm not sure if we're supposed to go all the way through and down the hand and I don't know. I'm going to go ahead. It might make it easier to get those fingers um, stitched to look like little fingers if they are um, stuffed a little bit. So I'm going to do it that way. It may not be correct, but I'm going to give it a go. I want some in that thumb. But whatever I do to this hand and arm, I'm going to do to the other hand and arm uh, so that they look the same. If something needs to change, I will change it when I do the boy version of the doll. Push this down. I am using my hand to get that down there. And then I'm going to take my squared off end and push it into the thumb. I just feel like it's easier. I think it will be easier for me if I do it this way. All right, next we are supposed to stitch through all thicknesses, right here, here, and here. And again, I'm gonna use the Bernina because it's a metal sewing machine. It's heavy duty, this is lightweight, and my Bernina is a high shank, and I have a little bit more room between the foot of my machine over there and the throat plate. So I'm going to do that and I'll be right back. Alright, the fingers have been stitched. Now I'm going to take my chopstick and kind of push this stuffing in there a little bit more. I kind of had to push it out of the way to stitch the fingers. Not all of it, but you know, a lot of it had to kind of get mushed out of the way there. Okay. There we go. And it might actually be easier or more effective to um, stitch those fingers by hand. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to use the machine on both because I did it on this one. I do need a little bit more of that stuffing in the thumb area. Okay, and now we are supposed to go ahead and tightly pack the rest of the arm and I will hit this area with the heat of my iron to get rid of those um, uh, friction ink marks. All right, here we go. So 5 eighths of an inch from the top edge of this section right here. And that's a nicely turned out arm. So I have to do this arm right here. There we have it. 
and I'm going to go erase the sink and I'll be right back. Then baste, and in this case I think I will be basting. So what we need to do is get these raw edges right along the top here. They need to be even. I am going to pin to hold them in place. And it's a bias cut right here so it will stretch. We need to be a little careful with that on both. I'm going to start in the bottom down here and it needs to be kind of close to the raw edge not into the you know deep into the fabric and I'm not going to stitch over a pin. It caught on the foot. All right. And this one. And you know, you're pretty good to go as long as you remember not to stitch over a pin. So we've basted the raw edges together and now we need to pin the arm sections to the front right along the edges here and here having the raw edges together and matching up all the symbols. So I will locate the front which is right here and then I have big dot and big dot. I'm going to put the arms on the, the front pattern piece in the same manner that they've done right here with my thumb sections facing up not down stitch the notched edge of the bottom piece number four as shown and that's edge stitching right along that edge that's notched on piece number four Oops, which is this one right here So what they mean is we're going to stitch, I'll use the friction ink so you can see what I'm talking about. We're going to come around and then we're going to come down here. So this is in between here is our stitch and we're going to start here to make this little reinforcing line of stitching so that we can take our scissors 
and clip into where the stitching is. We don't want to cut through the stitching, but just like that, which will allow this little flap to fold along this line of stitching. So, let's do the other side, and I need to get a little bit better. There we go. There we go. All right, and then once again, we're just going to cut right in up to the stitching like that. Okay, now we're going to take the back piece, this is the back, and have it right side out like so. And these dots are where my notches would be. And then I'm going to take right sides together and put the notch on the bottom section there. And the next notch lined up there. And there is a bit of fabric right here that will need to be pulled in. So we're going to press the seam toward the back, the, the back pattern piece. There's a small dot on the front of the doll body, and then I think you can still see that small dot. Ugh, it's kind of buried in the back. But those two are lining up right there, and that's where you want that to pin. And of course, the bottom and the back will be shorter than the front, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. And, and I'm stitching at a quarter of an inch, which is right here. And just be really careful not to stitch over a pin. And when you're removing pins, just be really careful not to get your finger in the way of any moving parts. A lot of people think that it's just the needle that will hurt you. Um, this shaft right here, this piece right here that sticks out, can really hurt your hand. It can hurt your finger. It can pinch you. Just best to keep your hands away from all these moving parts. Now I have got my um, darts flattened out open so that when I stitch over them They're going to stay nice and flat. Okay, I want to back up. One, two, three, come forward. Okay, and I'm going to pivot, and that keeps me on that quarter of an inch. I've got to make sure that my arm is out of the way and I'm just going to be stitching along the seam where I attached that arm. Remove this pin and go. Now I recommend that you think about what is the easiest 
way for you to stitch the other side. So if it works out for you to stitch from the bottom to the top, just remember everything has to be basically the same. You're just stitching it the other way around. So this bottom seam has to be facing toward me this time instead of away from me. I'm going to fold it down. I'm going to get my machine lined up properly. Quarter of an inch right there. Take out this pin. Normally I would just go ahead and drop my needle before I take out the pin, but I'm just doing it this way. I either have tape or glue on my hand, and either one is possible. I've had both near me today. Okay. Watch this pin, remove it. Flatten out all these things that need to be flattened out. And keep that arm, make sure it's not in the seam allowance there. Okay, and watch. Watch out. You're going to have to kind of measure, you know, what you think looks like a, a quarter of an inch. If it's difficult, if you're not sure, you can, like I've got mine at five-eighths of an inch, you can make your first guess and then stitch a few more. Oop. Okay, ow. And then pivot to check it again. Okay, that's definitely where I want to be. Make sure that the darts are pressed flat. This one's not, so I need to raise my presser foot and take something like a stiletto or something. I'm using a straight pin. Push it flat on the bottom. Make sure it stays flat and then stitch. Keep everything at a quarter of an inch. See how it looks. So the next big step is to turn this so that it's right side out. All right, so here we go. We're just going to flip out this and oh, there we go. Now this is the back and this is the front. Okay. We have the back and <clears throat> and the front. Okay. So next we will work on the legs. I want to read about them before I take the pattern paper off. So we stitch leg sections, leg number five sections together at the center front and center back seams ending at the symbols as shown. So we stop or start here and go up to there and then we stitch along here and we stop. So back seams and so pin the sole section to each leg section matching the symbols and stitch. Now they're showing that the back leg has been clipped at certain sections and I think I'm going to do that because we have these curves where the calf is so kind of here and here I'm just gonna make just kind of maybe about what is it two inches one inch about an inch apart and then on the front I've got the knee that pokes out so again, I'm just going to clip just to add a little bit of ease when this is turning. The ankle, obviously, I need to clip into that right there. That will help when I want to turn my 
leg around to the proper side. So the widest part of this piece, of piece number six, the widest part goes to the toe area and the narrow will go to the back of the foot. So there's a rectangle here and there's a rectangle on the heel part of the leg and we're going to match those up and pin down and I'm going to hold this oh, straight and line that up and open up this seam on the front part of the foot and sometimes fabric will just fight you fight back that's the only thing you can do is just fight back All right and then just you know you can pin on the sides if you feel like you need to like so and this is how they used to make socks back in the medieval times or when people started wearing clothes this is literally a, um, a almost a replica of the way they used to design their footwear their leg wear which I think is great alright so now I'm going to hold this flat like this Sure everything is flat you don't want any wrinkles if you're coming up to a wrinkle just pull it out Okay, let's see what we got. What are we supposed to do next? We are supposed to turn it right side out. Problem is, I want this foot to turn pretty, so I'm going to make some clips. They don't mention this, and I think they're assuming that if you're making a rag doll, you have basic sewing skills. So if you have basic sewing skills and you're thinking, shouldn't I be clipping corners and yes, yes, you should be. So go ahead and do it, even though the pattern isn't specifically calling it out. Okay, so I need to find a small piece of cardboard. So now it's going to tell me that I need to, using the guide for the cardboard numbers, insert the cardboard into each leg section at the foot. If I have it facing the wide part facing down instead of the thin part facing down, I can work the wide part toward the front of the foot. Now I will tell you, it says in the pattern to use heavy cardboard. I'm using heavy card stock. 
That's my preference. All right, there we go. Yep, you got to put the wide part down in the foot first. They're showing it the other way around, and I didn't have good luck with that. All right, there we go. Oh, perfect. So there's leg number one that looks like an old-timey stocking sock. All right, so we've done that part, and I think we're supposed to stuff this leg up to within five-eighths of an inch on the upper edge, and then baste the raw edges together. And those are basted in this manner. And again, I feel like I need to stitch this, even though they don't show that. So here's my wooden spoon, just straight from the kitchen. And I'm gonna see if this, oh, there is a definite difference if you use a wooden spoon.